the board. Um, this afternoon, I have with me some special friends who have met with me now three times as a part of our ESC advisory group. Um, presenting at the table today, kind of sharing out from the rest of the team, is Christine Garcia, uh, Bob Kardashi, Daniel Morris, Casey Corbett, and Daryl Greenwood is not here yet, but we anticipate her any moment. She is one of our ESC advocates. Uh, Christine, Bob, Daniel, and Casey are all members of our staff. <coughs> and then in our room as well, if we could go to the next slide, please. <coughs> There we go. I have the rest of the teams here, many of whom are in the room. So if you were a part of our meetings together, will you please stand? Just so that you can be recognized. As you can see, we had members from across the district um, involved in the discussion, and I, I feel like the discussions were productive. And while I'm not as big of a committee person as someone I know is, <laughs> um, I do believe that these conversations have been worthwhile. And the one thing that as a committee we really didn't get to yet is about ESC academic outcomes. We spent a lot of time talking about safety and classroom procedures that would eventually improve outcomes. But um, uh, the, if I were the board, I would recommend, or if I were the superintendent, but I'm not going to be anymore soon. Um, that this is something that maybe the conversation should continue over time. I think it's been really valuable. And again, welcome, Ms. Greenwood. Good to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Greenwood is one of our ESC advocates, a parent and grandparent, um, who does a lot to support our ESC families in, in the district. So with that, Ms. Garcia, I'm going to turn it over to you and the rest of the committee to kind of share with the board. And we want this to be a discussion and conversation as we move through the information. <coughs> So when we came together, we were tasked with how can we make it better, not just on the student side, but also on the staff side. So in the three times that we met, we thought individually, then we worked together as a group, and then we presented as a whole. And we looked for the common threads that came from these three meetings, and these would be the common threads. So the safety of students and staff members was, we thought, tantamount to everything that, that's occurring. And then some of the information that we asked for, we specifically asked for the workman's comp in relation to direct student care. And we got that in March, and it was pretty high. It was about 200 and something in direct relation to student care, and that's high. Um, then we talked about resources and how we could get certified and trained staff members, um, curriculum, of course, <coughs> assistive technology, and other um, supplemental tools. But with the certified and trained staff members, you'll see all this on the other slides. It's not just the teachers, it's also ESC, um, ESP support staff, and how we can build our own in that, because we feel like they're in the classrooms and they're the ones that are also getting hurt. Um, Age-appropriate placement of students is a big one, um, because as you know, we have transition students who can be upwards 21 years old with 13 year olds sometimes <coughs> on a campus, and if they are having some challenging behaviors, how does that, how do we deal with that? And it can be inappropriate behaviors of different kinds of natures, um, and they also take transportation with those students. Um, not only in relation to that, but also when you're talking about elementary school, some of our classrooms have K through five. We don't feel that that's developmentally appropriate either. And there needs to be clear and consistent communication, we feel, across the board. Transparency between ESC staff, um, the administrators, and protocols and procedures to follow because we don't feel that those are clear right now for everybody across the board. Yep. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> so when we talked about training for pairs and teachers and administrators, we thought that um, we are not actively reflecting the services that the students are receiving through their individual educational plan. And by not doing so, we're not getting the services needed because we're not pulling down the funding that we need for them. So uh, matrices training is tantamount to everybody in, I in IEP, and we need to have that. De-escalation is a big part of CPI, which is crisis prevention and intervention. Um, we feel like we need to practice that more. Uh, also CPI with required team practice. So CPI happens not with your team from your school. It can happen any time throughout the year based on when you're going to um, what say? 
when you're going to lose your certification. Right. And every trainer, and I've been a trainer in this county, will say, go back and practice with your team. If that is not built in to the day or to a PLC, it doesn't happen. And when you're talking about dealing with challenging behaviors, if you haven't practiced your de-escalation techniques, only one person talking at a time. We talked about that. Yeah. Um, if I can address that a little bit, sure. we'll, we'll have, um, you know, just because you, if you have a CPI team and your, your principal walks in, everybody's like, oh, the principal's going to take over. And that's not necessarily the case. It really should be whoever has that re relationship and rapport with that student. And it really should only be one person talking to that student because otherwise it you know, just becomes mumbo jumbo and you know, the, the, the child you're trying to de-escalate is now their, their head is literally spinning and that's not, that's not what you want to accomplish. You want to accomplish a calming, um, more adherence um, situation. And you're not going to get that if the person is you know, Christine speaking, and then, you know, Dan's talking, and then, you know, Daryl's, you know, you can't have that. You, you really need to have one person, and, re, you know, regardless if it's the principal or, or the superintendent walking in, it needs to be one person that takes that lead. And you have to practice that. We talked about using some of that PLC time on a Wednesday to um, kind of enhance um, the CPI team and some of the strategies and kind of do some mock um, situations so that people know what they need to do. Because the lead of the CPI team can be the strongest um, with the escalation techniques. It could be the person that has the most rapport. And if you have a brand new paraprofessional that has the most rapport and is talking to that student and calls for backup, and this team of people come in and it's their boss, it's very hard for them to say, I need you to do this, this, and this. But that's what the training dictates. So if we don't strengthen those teams, we're not giving them permission to do that. Is there like a CPI or like a, like a train the trainer, so to speak, like a senior CPI person in every school, so that way they can go to them for guidance and making sure that it's done properly and it's on schedule and like that? There is not, to my knowledge. Now, there are CPI trained individuals at every school, and how many times they've been trained, um, it could be the administrator. It needs to be. So who's it, tracking, who's responsible for that now? Is it the principal? Make sure that everyone's CPI trained, who's going through it, who's, you know, there's gotta be like, if it's It is my understanding title, that, or, that yes it is, it oh, would be the administrators, but you can't dictate somebody to take CPI training is what we've been told. You can't say that you need this training. It's highly recommended, but if you're in a, a classroom with challenging behaviors, if this person doesn't want to take it, I, we've been told you can't dictate it. So it might be a prerequisite to being in that kind of classroom. That might be something. When you take the training, the trainers will tell you, you are not here with your team. You need to go back and practice with your team. It is important that you go back and practice with your team. But that is something that does not occur because it's very hard to get that team together. And that's why we're asking for it to be mandated that at least every nine weeks or something, there is some PLC time built in so that CPI team can practice. Because the lead, the lead, it doesn't have to be the one that is the, the one that has the most CPI training. It could be the person that has the best report. And that could be a brand new peer that's walked in the door. And as long as they feel comfortable taking the lead, that's okay. You can trade off the lead. If you, if the kid, if the student is upset with you, and you're the one that's triggering that student, you can say, I can't talk right now. Ms. Corbett, I need you to take over. And then Ms. Corbett will take over and start dictating where everybody needs to go. So it's, it's a fluidness that you have to have when you are dealing with challenging behaviors. And I think that that's part of the breakdown. It is very important that you do have that fluidness because if you don't, then it can escalate very quickly. If there's no mandate, how do we ensure the number of people are trained saying depending on the student someone different may have to take the lead than the time before because of the report and things like that so how do we ensure we have a number of people I think, I think that steps into some of the clear and consistent protocols that we're asking for as a team right. those right. questions need to be answered before we get to the situation and there's nothing set right now that tells us what to do in that instance and I think that's where we're reaching out, and I think that would give us a clear path as to how to address the situation. 
And I think that's what we're asking for. Yeah. meetings all so you can see the right recommendations are kind of prioritized in terms of what the team felt like would make a, the most impact and I think a model scenario in a school that exists already is like a fair assessment tools for safety and security there's nobody that's there but we do have like a fair assessment done and now then we have training and that's more mandated the state makes you do that but right. the point is that we have a, a concept in place that we can kind of model that as far as I there is a threat assessment person that is in charge. Somebody's going to say there's going to be a lockdown or there's going to be a whatever. Maybe we should trade ESC or CPI at the same level of urgency. Even though the state isn't telling us that we have to do it, that we can do it on our own and kind of take the lead on it. I think, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, just how many people are on a CPI team? It depends on the team. You at least need three people. You at least need three because you need someone to take the lead. You may need two people if they have to do physical intervention, do physical intervention. Three is the least that you can have. You would like four to five because if that student falters, you want to be sure that you're doing, giving care, welfare, safety, and security, that somebody's in front of that student to catch if, if they're not holding correctly. It could be a differential in height. So if somebody taller than me takes a step and we haven't practiced and they take their gate and my gate is smaller, then we have opened up a, a position for that student to get out of that hole and that student is no longer um, safe. Yes? This is yeah. important that it's CPI. Sure. I want to say that each school does have a CPI team. This is Yolanda. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to mention that every school does have a CPI team, a CPI crisis team. So I think that that's not what we're asking. We're asking for time for them to practice. Correct. Okay. So we have about 700 to 800 people that get trained in CPI and they refresh every year. However, since COVID, we've had a shortage of teachers, so people have been canceling coming to refresh their CPI certification. So that will decrease the number of people um, at the school, right? The crisis team have been decreased over the last two or three years. Just correct me if I'm wrong, you want to refresh an annual refresh. Exactly. So every year we want them to refresh, you know, on those CPI de-escalation techniques. We want them to practice. They're not practicing with their teams. So that's kind of what we want to ask for that time during PLCs where a trainer or an instructor goes to those schools and practice and problem solve with those teams because that's important. That's the what we're missing. But every school does have a CPI crisis team. I think CPI is one of the most um, training that there is sometimes a waiting list where I have to say, come up with trainings. And we have more than 30 trainings every single year where there's a waiting list. And you know, for, for at least a week or so until we can get a location and have more training. So people are signing up and they want to sign up. I think it's a matter of then how do you practice with your team? I can go to a training with you, with you, with you, but then at your school, um, you may misunderstood or do it a little bit different. No, we want you at the same school to practice together. So I think that's kind of what we're asking for. And right? part of the policies and procedures is maybe letting the people know when they're trained who is the CPI team at their school. Exactly. Because the that's not is, that's not information have they have a right now. That is challenging, right? And we would like everybody in that classroom to be trained. Even though sometimes physically they will not be able to do a physical restraint, but they can certainly start the escalation process before it escalates to the behavior <coughs> being so escalated that it's hard to manage the physical aggression. We want it to start where people are able to identify that anxiety level for that student and start that de-escalation process. But if we, sorry, but if we don't have everybody in that classroom trained, then that's impossible. Now we're waiting for the administrator, the dean, to come. It probably takes a few minutes for them to rush to the classroom. They don't even know how it happened. 
but now they're entering the classroom at that level of escalation, which it's almost impossible to de-escalate. We just have to manage the aggression, right? But wouldn't it be nice that everybody is trained in that classroom dealing with that challenging behavior and have those skills to de-escalate? So by the time they get there, the situation is under control. You know, we're just kind of um, monitoring and making think, sure everybody is safe. That I think that's something you hit on. Minimize um, injuries. It's something Sorry, you hit on is that it needs to be part of the prerequisites for hiring that they have to take it. I've been lucky. I don't think any of my paras have ever said no, but I do know my colleagues have, at other schools have had paras that were like, nope, I don't, I'm, I'm not I'm taking it. And so they're like, why am I going to put my body on the line to de-escalate and destroy your rivers to do if I'm not going to call the for it? And so for me as a teacher, it's super hard to be like, okay, I can de-escalate, but my parents won't even go to the training to learn the de-escalation because there's nothing contraction that says that they have to. And so that's where I think that as a teacher, I would love it if it was in, written in the language of the contract that said that if you're in a self-contained ESC classroom, you will be CPI trained. Even if you can't do the whole thing, in high school it's super hard to do the CPI whole because most of the students are taller than my parents. My parents are all very small. I'm lucky because I nobody's taller than I am in my classroom, but it's not always been that way. So right now I'm able to handle my behaviors because I, I've been trained and I know how to do it when my parents are at. They're like, okay, I'm not CPI trained, but I can't help you. So it's frustrating. Is there a financial incentive? Is there a what? Is there a financial incentive to right now? Right now? No, sir. It hasn't been in 25 years that I've been in those county. We consider I through our contractual efforts. And there are there are other there are other trainings as well. But you want to Just um, <laughs> when when I first addressed the board, um, it talks about <clears throat> other trainings for students, maybe that are of those larger sizes, because once you get into middle school and high school, the CPI kind of, it's very difficult to do because of their size. So there are other trainings for students of larger sizes um, that I think would be important to, to explore as well. Um, I think to overlook it and just say let's keep it the status quo might put us back in another situation. It would be That's difficult to do. And right now we have a one size fits all one. And here's the other monkey wrench. I hate to put a monkey wrench. I just went to a safety meeting this past week. What about transportation? Because I was on a bus and I had an incident. We did. Well, I don't know how much I'm allowed to reveal because it wasn't an expulsion hearing, but we had an ESC student on the bus mm -hmm. and it slipped out. And the bus had to deal with their own protocols. What CPI response or training is for bus drivers and for Bus drivers and monitors are offered CPI training as well, and especially if they have challenging students on their bus, um, they are sometimes offered individual training that I'm aware of. And I'm already creating. But they aren't invited to take it. That's right. So they are allowed to take it, right? So they're allowed, they're, they're allowed to. Right. invited to, but there's nothing that says they have to. And the financial incentive, I think, would be, would be helpful. Right. But we have a waiting list on the training, so there's also a matter of capacity for the training. Well, there's hybrid trainings they can look into too to research, so you could do online things um, and then practice individually. There's different ways that you can do it too that they would have to look at if you're talking about financial. Are you, are you going to go into the financial aspects of this? That you know, we did not talk about financial so aspects. So I'd, I'd like to talk about that because yeah. I think that that clearly makes sense, sure. right? Just like you get a supplement for being a coach. This is like one of those things where you should receive, obviously, a supplement or something because it's, sure. it's you're there doing right. a so task, right? It's, ESE teachers receive a supplement for all the extra work right. that they do, but ESE parents do not receive a supplement, and it's not a supplement necessarily for CPI. But they should, and it should be also maybe an additional one for the... Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Sorry. <laughs> You're not going to argue. I'm an ESE teacher. I'm on board. <laughs> You're not arguing, I know, but... Right, right, right. <laughs> It would, it, would, it would make sense, right? That's what you said. This is, this is the toughest environment. It is. Right? There's not going to be a lot of environments that are Correct. that are more difficult than this. Right. But there's also, if you come down to the next bullet where it says RBT, 
Um, a wage differential. Right. So an RBT, we could do an RBT training because we do have certified behavior board analysts that could do the RBT training for paras that are in those classrooms with challenging behavior if they wanted to take it. And if they pass the test and they are a registered behavior technician, they could get paid um, extra as well. That's, so that's another financial way to go about that. Maybe not just with CPI training, but then you're kind of growing your own as well because right now we are contracting out. Yeah. And that would be the best of both worlds because not only are they getting the CPI, but they're learning other behavior techniques to use for the de-escalation portion yeah. so they're that they're even the better. Right. Correct. Mm -hmm. I mean, and the end state goal would be to have them become an actual teacher, right? Correct. So, Correct. I mean. But we did talk about the fact that that RBT for Paris, for ESC Paris, mm -hmm. provides a career pathway. Correct. Um, which we feel like could be a strong incentive at the workplace. Correct. I like that. I think, if you don't mind, I mean, I don't want to get, I don't think any of us want to get stuck in implementation. This is right. recommendation time, right? All the so I wonder if we could, you've presented the first recommendations. Thank you so much. If we can just continue, because I know we're we'll probably going to have a follow up for implementation. I don't think sure. this is what this conversation is about. Sure. Okay. So I'm going to let Ms. Greenwood talk Thanks. about the quarterly parent. <laughs> I'm actually going to go back and talk about safety sure. with the students and the parent concerns. And I can give you several examples over the past year, year and a half. One is a student that was, um, that is currently at Toho, and so that was in Mr. Morris's class there. Previous to that, he was at another high school, which will remain nameless, and we had another major incident at that school a year ago last fall. And so we have to look at it from the student perspective as well, that those students, especially at the other high school, the initial high school the student was at, they all had PTSD after that. And it, it, was, it was documented. Um, I, had, I had kids that suffered trauma that didn't return to school again for the rest of last school year because of what had taken place, what they had witnessed. Thank God I did check with Mr. Morris to make sure my student was not witness to what happened to him at Toho. But there again, you know, it's multiple instances where our students are faced with watching this aggression and the impact it has on them, especially if they don't have the intellectual ability to process it the way we do as adults. So, so this is a capacity, uh, not a capacity, an exposure issue to other exposure. students? Mm -hmm. The impact of, of aggression on teachers and other students that it has on the rest of the classroom. It, it's a tremendous effect and... Um, what is your recommendation for this one, for that kind of issue? My recommendation would be that, number one, we, we have the trained CPI people in the classroom. We have more than a three-team we had for those with aggressive, with challenging behaviors, excuse me, we shouldn't say aggressive, with challenging <coughs> behaviors in the classroom, we do have the entire team trained and we have, we have drills, just like we do for fire, tornado, <coughs> we have drills where that team learns how to work together. It's one of the biggest things I hear from the teachers that I work with is that there just isn't enough time and I get it, I get it. I was in the classroom eons ago, but um, I, I get that. And we just have to, we have to figure out a way to carve out the time that we can give them the support that they need. It's not that our ESE department isn't willing to give them the support. It's not that the school-based principals are not willing. It's making it a priority to carve out the time. Is that the regional model? Is that what you're talking about now? No, I'm not. No, we're still. No, we're still under, we're still under safety, and I'm talking about the parents and the students' um, safety concerns as well as the classroom teachers and rest of the faculty. Number two, um, another safety is the grouping of kids of our students. That's going to come up in a couple of slides. K through five. So I'll I'll mm -hmm. table that, but it's. Truly, I have a little guy who's a peanut. He's a kindergartner. 
and I have a fifth grader in that same classroom. And that fifth grader has extremely challenging behaviors. And I had a principal say to me, you are an advocate for both of those kids. You, how can you say we can put the one with the challenging behaviors back in that classroom with this little peanut? And I, I understand that, but they both deserve an education. They both deserve faith. Um, next one is the bus. I have, I've, I'm here to give examples. I have um, my grandson, who I can talk about without any confidentiality release, is on a bus with neurotypical kids. He absolutely loves it. They love him. It's a perfect case scenario. However, I've got another little guy who was on a bus, and it was a substitute driver. And that substitute driver just told him to go to the back of the bus. This is a little guy who is on the spectrum. And thank God his older sister was on the bus that day because he's supposed to be in the harness just for safety. <coughs> and he was not harnessed. And he was in the, they put him all the way in the back of the bus by the emergency door. And there again, we don't have the trained staff on those buses, especially when we have neurotypical and special needs mixed, to recognize what they were supposed to be doing. I'll, I'll be quick. I'm, I'm, so the next one would be the quarterly meetings with? Um, right. But there are parent concerns, too, for safety. The parents, this is this one child dropped out of school. Not dropped out. He was kept on uh, FDE last year. The parents were concerned about sending him back to school. I have another one that just occurred within the past week. Parents are not going to send this child back to school because of safety concerns. Just highlighting that. Um, and then finally, you want me to talk about the um, training now? The training for parents? The, the training for parents? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, we have, we have so many priorities in this district that parents have been overlooked. And parents truly feel the need to learn and to work with and be a contributing part of the IEP team. But we don't give them any of the tools that they need to be effective partners in the IEP team. And we are told that that has to be. Um, and I've shown this at our meeting as well. There's, this is a book. It's no longer available in print from the state. It's a copyright 2012. So it's old, but it hasn't been updated. And it's electronically available out on the uh, website for Florida Department of Education. It is a comprehensive syllabus of information for parents and I spoke at, at, to the Orange County um, group last week, and they are going to start printing this and making it available to their um, students that are coming into preschool ESE, just to give them some foundations. I'm, I am going to talk financial. I'm looking for <laughs> you to add a line um, that would allow the district to copy this and as we have new students, because we have so many of our parents that don't have access or don't have familiarity with the internet. So to assume that they can go out and download this from the, the website is, we can't do that for half of our parents. Um, so I would like to add a line item that gives us print, the ability to print these and hand these to every new family that comes into the ESC program. Um, so there's your financially. Anything else? I'm a, I That's can't good see for that. Okay, so good. We're gonna go well, you can, can you see? Oh, sorry. I'm it's it's okay. Gotcha. Okay. So the next one would be the hubs for ESE. Um, so there are going to be hubs for regional, um, I believe it's emotional behavioral disorder, and Mill Creek, Lakeview, and Pointiana. And one more central. Yep. I forgot to put to the slide. I apologize. And central as well. Um, and that's in an effort to have those challenging behaviors maybe at a, a school that has some expertise with that. 
In addition, there are going to be some other layers of support assigned to those <coughs> specific regions so that our principals and teachers and support staff can get to know a particular team that includes your speech language psychologist, your OTPTs, some of your behavior folks. I apologize. I think, but you're right. I think it's for, it might be further on, but that's okay. Well, you guys talk about it. I'd <laughs> no, it's okay. You keep going. You're good. You keep That's going. Good. Go. But I do think it's in the slides further on, too. Okay. Now, right. this is similar to, like, um, I know, like, a part in some that's hard of hearing. And that's, like, you know, so we try to concentrate those students to go to that school. Is that what the hub means? Or is yes. that more like yeah. a training for staff? No. So no. we got, like, students that are high on the spectrum. We try to choice them to go to these schools. So that we would so it, be high on the spectrum. It's only emotional behavioral disorder students. And everybody has... Um, it's my understanding, classrooms for students with ASD on the spectrum. That's something that In many of my peers, um, the model that we had prior did do that. So um, I'm totally making this up, but let's say Mill Creek Special has the EBD unit, but Neptune has um, ASD units, Parton has DHH. Um, you know, IND goes to another site. That way that staff specializes in and that disability. For example, my speech teacher at my school, because we're DHH, she signs, she has, you know, training in that, that type of thing. Um, we've gone away from that where they're all coming to their home zone school. Other than DHH, they still all come to me. Um, but that's something my peers wanted me to share is that they they found the model more helpful yeah, when you specialize. We're short with teachers. I mean, and now if it spread out, now you're not getting, like you said, that specialized instruction. Is it best to have? One of the challenges that Mrs. Saluka and her team have found is that students' labels, so to speak, were changing over time, and so students were moving from school to school to school as opposed to having a home base. The ABD students, we definitely need to have in a specific unit at those units. But with the ASD and IND, it was going back and forth. But that is something that Mrs. Um, Corbett and the team have talked about, our teachers have talked about, so we're continuing to look at that as we move forward. And I want to definitely China. provide those ESD support hubs in the regions. I apologize. No, that's okay. I, I interrupted you. I didn't know that you weren't done. I apologize. But that's a great concern for me as an advocate, as a grandmother, as a sister, as a all of the above with ESE students. We are going back 20 years in special education. The, the term today that you hear most often is inclusion. And that's where we include all of our students. All means all. We include all of our students on the same campus, typically neighborhood locations. So if we start going back, and I'm, I'm not in, a, in disagreement with our challenging behaviors, because we need to create a central hub to get all of the extra, extra support they need together. But if we start taking our ASD, our IND, and putting them together in hub schools, then we are completely defeating what FAPE and IDEA is all about. Um, and if, I actually, if, unless it, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I actually agree with this, which is what I was going to say. Um, I was, I actually think it's a great idea when it comes to resources because I feel like that's what we're trying to answer right now is like having all resources in the same in the same place, which is an effective way um, to help students. But I did have the concern about, or if we thought about the concern about parents who might might feel like we're siloing children in specific areas. And how, if we go through the to this model, what are some of the watchouts that we may have to consider? Well, it's an OCR complaint. Right for, well, yeah. That's if if you've put them in a self-contained unit and they don't, they have no access to their their peers. But ideally, I mean, I run the program in my school. My DHH kids are with my typical students all the time, so it's not a matter of of them not getting to be with their peers because they are and the thought that my peers had was that if you group schools closely like St. Cloud Elementary, Lakeview, Parton and Neptune are all within two and a half miles, three miles of each other then the kids are still because of choice 
because I have kids that choice that are in the St. Cloud zone and the Neptune, they're still going to be with kids from their neighborhood. But they're not they, going to school with their brothers and their sisters. And yes, they always get to come with their child. They shouldn't have, they should be brothers and sisters should not be. It's a recommendation. No, I mean, I think it's a great recommendation to be clear. I've heard this before and I was like, this makes sense from a, from the perspective of, of Okay. making sure we have allocating resources and all that complete times like see that black and white i do i do think that i'm not familiar with the terminology that you're that you're speaking of but it does feel like it might open us up to some kind of situations and i agree this is a great idea i just wonder if we can if this is a recommendation the implementation aspect is what i'm concerned about like how are we going to implement this and ensure that parents feel like they have a choice and that their children are included that's all and it's part of the policies and procedures that sure. need to be yeah. so in as well what, i guess the biggest problem right is really that this is even inside of the groups that they're labeled within they're not homogenous at all right mm -hmm. and, i mean it's so it's 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 such a sporadic labels you know that one child can be this but they're also this and that and whatever well, that's why it's called they're all challenges yeah. right, right. I, well, I didn't even want to mention them you know <laughs> I, I mean I, I the, the point is it's 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 a lot right. right and it's so individual that really maybe we should be trying to resolve I also like it from a point you know standpoint of allocating resources this makes it easier it makes it make sense but then you might end up with exactly the problem that you're stating, different age groups, different ability levels, you know, then they're also isolated. It, it, I mean, so maybe isn't there some way to track the population on an individual level and then determine the programs based on what our actual population is? Because yes, there is. It's this all is, the allocation meetings that happen with the SE. You how often do they happen? Every year. Yearly. So every year, so at the beginning of the year, they do it usually in spring for the next year. Okay, so in spring for the next year, they get together the and they decide. Bring all of the um, groups and let them know how many speech and language need is needed, all the different individual needs. We'll and all the money is the same, right? So like a rotate on something like that, because let's say Neptune has twenty ESE kids one year, making it up, right? The next year they got fifty. You know what I'm saying? So we have to rotate ESE teachers from somewhere else to, to be at that school because the cohorts are different. Correct. That's a heck of a challenge Correct. to be able to do that. Correct. That's why the rest and of the And then it shows it's a are we asking teachers, <laughs> and, are asking teachers in the new schools then? Yeah. They go back and forth. Every, wow. Yeah. And they're not really complaining about that? Oof. Well, I mean, it's lower on the list. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, 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 there's other things that are more okay. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. So. I wonder so that we can move to the next thing with regards to this recommendation because I do feel like most I haven't heard from everyone but it sounds like definitely the allocation of resources is important I wonder if there's like a maybe a way to get gain feedback from the parents of the students who might be effective in seeing well, this recommendation came directly from me I believe not from this committee okay Part of part of but I, right. Yeah, but I wonder if moving into the implementation steps, right, if we right. decide this is definitely a good idea, like how we can um, gauge what the com our parents, the community who will be affected, feels about yes. this particular thing. Let me point out that it's probably an allocation question is for our speech and language, our OT, um, those support people, because we're still going to have to have the same number of teachers for the, the number of students we have in that classroom. So it's, we're not talking about teachers here, which I know we're, we're short on. We're talking about the support people that come in and work with them. Um, so as of right now, those people have three or four schools that they're assigned to. Some only have one, it just depends on the caseload every year. Um, so just to clarify allocation. Well, and also some of the behavior people go from county to county. County to county? From end to end. Oh, end to end. Yeah. Yep. Same type of thing in terms of we look at the allocation meetings, we look at the kids that are coming in, the kids that are articulating us, what are their IPs say, what are the needs, and that's how we look at the research value. Right now, what's up? How's the hospital? The hospital? The hubs would cover middle and high as well in terms of that region. So they would be more regional based to get to build those relationships and also follow families. Why do we make the hubs K to the elementary center for that very reason? The 
elementary EPD centers aren't just elementary, but then in terms of the support teams, they also need to be Does that make sense? It's going to be a couple of slides, I think. Okay. Couple of so the next recommendation was um, having an ESE coach, just like we have reading and math coaches, so side-by-side -side coaching and modeling for those self-contained teachers. Um, and BE classroom settings as well because we know that there are new teachers in BE settings um, and how do you deliver services and how do you pull an IEP and make up those schedules. It's a very hard thing if you've never done it. You would like me to speak louder? I can do that. <laughs> um, and increase that academic and look at the really the MTSS of it, not just with the challenging behaviors but looking at the academic sort um, and how do we make sure that that curve is going to meet with their same age peers. And again, there's always a push that our lowest performing group is our ESE group. Having a coach that that's what their job is, even to work with the regular ed teachers who have the VE students, you know, techniques and that kind of thing. It's not that the regular math and the regular reading coach can't do some of it, but the amount of work they already have to then add that and then you know the RCS there's so much into the compliance and the paperwork end of it that there's not enough time in the day for them to be able to also support in the classroom and basically help train and model how to do things just like the reading and math coach do what for the, the other teachers of the global student population of this that's the question, question. Well, well, the, yeah, it's about 4 percent of our The other issue is, is our county is growing so fast that we're getting kids from not just all over the country but all over the world that are bringing, you know, many of their own different issues and different disabilities that it's taking us a little bit of time to detect. So once we detect that, we want to expedite. Um, we want to expedite the process to get that student to where they need to be in the right, in the right um, classroom, in the right school, in the right setting. It could be EEC and ELL at the same time. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, we we chuckle about it, but you're absolutely right. And we do understand that then that's also taking a teacher out of the classroom. So maybe utilizing some of the district people that we have now. So if you have compliance specialists, can they? give a training on how to look at data, to look at that MTSS data and do that in a monthly PLC. Um, if the behavior team can put something on where everybody can come into a team meeting. So utilizing the staff that we have, maybe if this isn't uh, a school by school that you can do, because we do know that we are short and that will be taking teachers away from. This is the one that gave me great heart from. <laughs> but, but utilize it, the classroom it size, depends. It, it depends. I have eight right now. I have there are some that have 15. Yeah, I'm upwards of 14. Upwards of 14? Like that right now. They tend to, you know, the mobility is high in those units too sometimes. And this gave me pause, not because of the need, because I, I do believe the need is real. It's just we're working so hard to find enough ESE teachers to serve our classrooms. Where are we going to find more ESC teachers to provide this coaching? And so the team discussed, you know, how else can we use our resource compliance specialists? Our RCSs are obviously very, very tasked right now with some other things. But let's look at the resources that we currently have as we build more, because we do believe that the side-by-side -side coaching and modeling is going to be super important, so that we're focusing on the learning and not just the compliance end of it. How many so, ESC personnel do we have? While she's looking that up, when it, that's the we want to really take advantage of those Wednesdays because a lot of those paras, not that sterilization of the room and wiping stuff down is not important, it is, but that could be done during the day, different parts of the day. But utilizing that hour every week for some form of a training, maybe either through a Moodle or through Teams or something, you know, that that because just like the kids you know adults learn by seeing a whole lot quicker than they do by reading it or just hearing it 
So if you have that that modeling via, you know, a Moodle or a Teams, then staff capacity is yeah. an overarching theme right. throughout the conversation. Right. Um, we're talking about potentially making better use of pre-planning, maybe doing some days during the summer, and then that ongoing support mm -hmm. for not just the teachers but also the paraprofessionals. Um, so that instead of doing after car duty, they're really working side by side with those teachers in the classroom and developing their skills about how to better serve the children in the classroom. Is there a way that we could possibly create a grant for that ESC coaching component only? Because like, can we write something and say, hey, you want to do a pilot program because it doesn't exist? Because this is the, the current allocation to get ESC funds for everything else we've got to do. Operations of laundry list things we've got to get. We've got to get wheelchairs, this, that. <laughs> I'm pretty sure there's no more friends that go. You know, I don't even have to be a rocket scientist to understand that. So if we want to try to use an ESC coaching model, are there grants that we could potentially create or ask the federal government to help? Now, the only problem with the grants, not recurring versus recurring, because once you fall in love with the program, they like it, and it may go away. But at the very minimum, to at least to see if it works. So it would be a question for the grant writers we, for the ESC. We, we do have grant writers that write grants. But also, the, the matrices training, we believe, could really help us because when we've looked at our ESC and our ESC funding in comparison to other districts, as you break down the FEFP formula, it appears that that's an area where we're consistently low based on the population that we have. <coughs> and the team, one of the things the team did was to look at class by class what a self-contained classroom costs in terms of staffing compared to the FTE that's generated by the average number of those students, and we pay more than in terms of the extra FTE, including IDEA, but we just have to make sure we're using wise dollars. Let's make sure we get through Correct. these couple But part of that is building the capacity to teach building the, the data, otherwise you're going to have to pay that money back, and you can't do that either. Um, so the barriers um, for the expectations for collaboration, so having an open line of collaboration between classrooms, between settings, OTs, PTs, common planning was a big thing. PLCs need to be more directed towards ESC classrooms. So if you're a transition teacher and there's not another like teacher on your campus, how are you reaching out to your peers um, to discuss moving that student forward to be self-sufficient, maybe coming from uh, supportive employment into independent employment? and pre-planning time, not only for teachers, but also for the pair, the ESPs, to participate in some of that training as well. Okay. I think I'm gonna yes. slide with my other point <coughs> was to be. Um, the, because of the teacher shortage, we have a lack of certified teachers. This can go hand in hand. And so I have, a student who hasn't had a certified teacher in his classroom for the past two years. And I've worked with Dr. Pace and we've made accommodations <coughs> to get a VE teacher teaching him his math and his reading. She's great to work with as far as that is concerned. But I have another, I have another teacher who has several of my kiddos who is not fluent in the English language and has a certification in art, nothing, no ESE. And I am having great difficulty placing a nonverbal student in that school next year when he's having enough of a time processing the English language. Um, just, just think, I know that you were in Puerto Rico recruiting teachers, and I think that's fantastic. And we have fantastic teachers of all nationalities, but we need to make sure that English is the primary language that is spoken in the classroom. And I know from my families that this teacher speaks a lot of Spanish, and many of her Hispanic kiddos don't speak the language. They can pick up pieces, but they don't speak the language. So we just have to be careful as we do this hiring. Fantastic teachers, but we have to make sure not they certainly can be bilingual, but they have to be fluent in English. Um, That's not a requirement. Is that a re is that not a requirment? They have to pass the certification test, and it's given in English. Yeah, they have to pass this. They, they're on a temporary. I mean, even if you can on paper, conversationally. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> okay. 
So the next slide is we had concerns with the challenging behaviors of students that were adults. I know that the ERC team has worked hard and they're going to do an alternative transition site at Zenith where it's not necessarily a bell to bell but will mimic a work schedule. Um, maybe getting some social service agencies involved in that, helping parents maybe fill out agencies for persons with disabilities and things like that so that um, it will help those challenging behaviors and possibly get them to support an employment. Um, we just have to be careful that we move them forward and if we're not, are we saying how do they come back to the regular school and the work environment if they, and what are the policies and procedures? It has to be, make sure that we have curriculum, not just that they're matching, that they're doing something that is work related. So I've been tasked with that at the current moment um, for the Zenith site. <clears throat> and my goal really here is to not only to add that social aspect to those children with behaviors, to work on those social skills, but also to make sure that they're getting the same type of curriculum that the regular transition student in the regular schools is getting with that extra piece, with that extra focus on those social skills, and in a place where they can have that extra support. Um, although it is in one site, it goes back to, again, pulling those resources and the right people to be in the right environment for those kids so that we can transition them out of that site back to the in-school transitions and then to possibly supported employment in the future. Um, so the, the difficulty then becomes, and I've stated this before, but I really wanted to press on, when you're putting adults with underage students, that creates a very large issue. And I think it's something that if we don't address it now or in the near future, we're going to have to continually address it until we make the right decision. Now, are there different ESC tracks? Because Dr. Faith has kind of mentioned it. Because I can imagine, and I don't know for sure, I'm just kind of using pure logic here. Some folks are so on one end of the spectrum, for instance, they don't have to be um, autism, it just be anything, just on right. one end. Where ADLs, where you know daily living things is really the end goal, can they be able to do things like you know wash their own laundry and things like that, versus those that are highly functioning and might need to get employment placement. So I think I've seen sometimes they have like a little internship program here okay. where they rotate through there. Are those like two different tracks, or is it just one track and then we just kind of say, okay, this student has better chance of doing an internship? This so you're allowed to defer your diploma. So all the students that are in transition have already gone through and earned their credits for the diploma. You are allowed to defer your diploma for CTE, college, a work study program, or independent functioning. So those are essentially the tracks that there are. So independent functioning. Um, the problem was, and there's a big history of it, there used to be what was called sheltered workshops. And the problem with sheltered workshops that they were finding is that um, people with disabilities were getting paid pennies wages to do wages. So there are no more sheltered workshops. So that independent functioning was great because then we could say you were going to go on and do some sheltered workshops. And now everybody has to go, if you go through vocational rehabilitation, you have to go through a discovery process to show are you going to go to a day program. Day programs have to go out in the community and try to work. And part of that was because they were finding that these sheltered workshops were not paying them their wages. So even though we're doing independent functioning, the end goal is independent functioning within your community for everybody. Are we having trouble finding employers that want to participate in the program? Um, I have never had trouble finding mm -hmm. employers. Like I work with publics. So, um, that's what I'm, I'm not saying it. I'm no, just asking. I don't have no. Um, if you go out to the employers and you talk to them, you can get them. We got Orlando Health at St. Cloud. My kids work Tuesday and Thursday. That's why you always see me in this uniform. Um, as long as those transition teachers have time built in to go out and do it, it's it's not a problem. You just have to kind of form those relationships. One of the, one of the difficulties we're finding that I wanted to touch on it since we're here you. is the transportation to those sites. We only have a certain number of vans. The van, like with the van we have at Toho, fits five kids. Five kids and the driver. <laughs> you have an abnormally large student, may take up two seats. So that's why I said five. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> so we're we're finding uh, that we don't have the adequate transportation to get the students back and forth. To we we would definitely have more sites out in the community, better training for these kids. We don't have the adequate transportation to get them back and forth. 
that is something that I have asked Mr. Um, Creech to prioritize looking for is some additional bands specifically for those purposes. And all folks so for our like any vento kids, our ones and twosies, those long term transportation where you could do a van with the driver um, without having to have a CDL and be able to, to help support these programs. Right. And like a thing cloud, I can take the bus. We walk up, we take the bus. Right, but in Toho, I, yeah, they can't. there were times I'd, I'd have taken a hay ride if I could have had it. You know what I mean? <laughs> but just anything I could, could do to get these kids out, and, and we were stuck. Yeah. We were stuck. Uh, Ms. Garcia, thank you. Thank you all, team, for this conversation. Um, I think this is the beginning of the conversation, certainly not the end. The ESC team is now taking this information back in terms of planning for implementation moving forward. And again, I, I hope that this is more the beginning of the conversation than the end and appreciate everybody's time. And I would recommend that you continue an ESC advisory. It doesn't have to be all of us. You can invite other people. But I do think putting it on the forefront is going to decrease those practices of challenging behavior. From the board perspective, I mean, I'm one person. I would love to see it be like a permanent thing. I do like the fact that you guys are cross-sectional. I like healthy conversation. Mm -hmm. and I mean, sometimes it may not always be what we want to hear, but I like the fact that you guys, I feel, like, I don't know you, <laughs> but I feel like I'm getting like unbiased advice. Honestly, you're telling me what you really think, and we want to get better. And you know, we, we know it's not perfect, and we can't improve on something unless we hear honest feedback right. and start you know, fi fixing those gaps. Yeah, it's it's the whole team. Yeah, mm -hmm. and it's it was the whole team. Yeah, I would recommend that you guys stay in place and actually see through the processes uh, once we begin implementation, then I'm not sure that there's anybody better than you guys to tell us the results and make sure. And well, we can learn from other people, so it should be open to us, I mean, I know, but absolutely. I'd like to have a couple of parents represented. I think that's a great idea, yeah. You're in charge of that, Greenwood. <laughs> Yes. They're all our kids. We have to move them. Yeah. All they got was a snack and a bottle of water. That was it. I appreciate many more of the sessions and that we're coming back so quickly with some I just right. want to thank you all as well because when I came to the school board meeting last November and asked if we could do a workshop, and asked if I could be included. I, I made it clear to everyone that Dr. Pace and I are, I are not good buddies, per se. We respect one another. <laughs> but that's not the reason that I'm on this committee. It's because I asked to be. I, so I just wanted to clarify that. And we're better buddies now. We are better buddies now. <laughs> we are better buddies. We respect each other. I think the only thing is, because I'm looking around, it's nothing but staff. Can we have, like, maybe another? I'm, yeah, I'm the only non-district employee. Yeah, I would like to see this non recognition, at least one or two more other We parents. need parents. At least a parent on each grade level. I like agree. One exactly. parent from elementary school, one parent from the middle. And just to give me I can supply them. <laughs> that would be my All recommendation. Right. But the, the thing with the recommendation with that, you also have to think about supplying child care because they have a student that has a disability. So if you do that, please please keep in consideration that if they, they're, if they can do they're, well, they're giving their time too and sometimes they will need that care as well. So if we do that, maybe reaching out to some of the child care participants and having it on a high school campus where they could earn some volunteer hours. I mean, just in that, in that aspect. Christine and I talked about that before that too for the parent-centered meetings that we have in the future. But um, Thank you. Thank you all so very much. I appreciate you. Thank you. And so now um, we have our assistant soups and directors here. Michelle Henninger is representing Dr. Allen and our middle school team, Dr. Evans, Dr. Reyes, all of the directors, including Leah from Hathaway, and coordinators are in the room to provide you a little bit of an update as we're getting ready to start our PM3 and EOCs. So team, I'll turn it over to you. We do not have a PowerPoint for this information. Instead, they've prepared a handout for everyone. Yes. A little for PowerPoint slide. <laughs> so I'll get us started. Be sure to use your louder voice because we're kind of far apart in here. And I think there are. So good afternoon, board, and on behalf of the academic success team, we do appreciate the opportunity for the continued um, conversation around goal one. 
Uh, well, we're in the baseline year. This first implementation of the best standards and fast assessment, we continue to press forward and we maximize our work to close the achievement gap for our students uh, that have unfinished learning. That includes all students that have unfinished learning. Um, each level, meaning every time you hear that, elementary, middle, and high school, um, has taken on a modified continuous improvement model or uh, modified SIM uh, to process and drive the work toward this goal. So because the state is still determining the threshold indicating proficiency, they haven't come to say this is the threshold. Uh, what we're looking for is the data movement toward that proficiency range. So we do utilize proven assessments to inform instruction, and we're going to be reviewing with you all today the data that we've gathered um, on our work thus far. Because conditions for learning are critical, a system driver to maximize this work, VPK through 12, is our commitment to implement AVID strategies in each content area. So as it was stated during our last school board meeting during our superintendent's update, um, our AVID National Demonstration High Schools have a higher graduation rate than our other comprehensive high schools. Um, with St. Cloud High School right now being at a 93% and Point Siena High School right now being at a 92%. To strengthen and continue the expansion of the beneficial impacts of school-wide AVID implementation, um, we are proposing that at least three instructional staff and one administrative staff from each of our schools. Uh, they're scheduled now to attend and engage in our upcoming AVID uh, Summer Institute scheduled for June 26th to June 28th. That's local, right? Yes, ma'am. That's here. Other summer professional learning will focus on uh, core standards, high quality instructional materials, and pedagogy um, to impact achievement for all of our students. On tonight's board agenda, you'll see on an, as an information agenda item uh, the comprehensive list of all of those offerings for the summer. Uh, with a few exceptions, we are um, really targeting our professional learning for July offerings as we focus our attention on the June uh, Camp Osceola experience this year. Now, while we have prioritized our certified district leaders and non-classroom instructional staff to work with students in small groups and filling great critical vacancies, uh, we wanted to show that best continuous work that has happened since January. We did not stop doing that. Um, at the same time, our classroom teachers need support and we continue to provide it. So I'm going to invite you to look at pages two through four. And those charts tell you how many interactions we've had thus far um, with supporting teachers and as well as what kind of support the teachers have received. So I'll give you a moment to look through those. While we're doing that, there's one thing that kind of stands out for me a little bit is that while I appreciate AVID and the way it kind of organizes the learning structure a little bit, I'm just somewhat concerned that there's almost like an overemphasis on the AVID. So I don't know if it's going to decrease that achievement gap. Like, for instance, like if I know we did the PMI 1 and PMI 2, I know Dr. Pace is struggling and Heather's doing great. I'm just making it up. Just making it up, right? And um, <laughs> to me, though, student. we know that she's the one that's the struggling student. And um, wouldn't we have like more shorter, like formative assessments, like almost like pop quizzes that aren't really graded against them and be like soon whatever? But if I know she's struggling, then we just kind of give them an extra coach, kind of like what you're doing, and doing like a quick assessment just for our own purposes. Not to have like big statewide mandated tests or anything like that. I mean, now we're talk towards the grade, but just to let you know. Get some feedback on that student. Is Dr. Pace catching up? You know oh my answer? goodness. <laughs> I love to hear that because you just described our modified SIM process. And we call it modified uh, because we began in the middle of the school year and we were very tight on the processes. Uh, but next school year, we have had principals and teachers alike come and say, we want to do this process starting off the year. So I'm actually starting their training um, here in May, continuing through the summer and getting us geared up uh, through August. I know that my peers are as well in their form during uh, middle and high school. 
Um, we do have those um, short assessments. They, we call them mini assessments, and I'm going to talk about them in just a minute. I think I have a, one of my daughters has been telling me about hers in civics, I think. So yes. <laughs> it sounded a lot like what she's been doing. Yes. So. <laughs> Absolutely. Can I ask real quick? Yeah. The biggest um, component on each of these seems to be other. So what falls into the other component since that's the largest one? Other, <laughs> other shouldn't be the largest component. <laughs> Theoretically, it should be the Well, smallest. like for example, would you like to pick a chart to look at? Well, each one of them, for high school, middle, and... Uh, the high school uh, has, like, the biggest gap. Yeah, yeah, elementary was the lowest, I guess. But middle and high, it both, it both said other was the highest type of interaction okay. for the coaching and support. So I'm just wondering what other would fall. I can share elementary, and then maybe you ladies want to chime mm -hmm. in for, for middle and high school. Um, so for elementary, other could be on-the-spot help. I'm a little guilty about that. I'll go in a classroom, I see a teacher struggling, I'll say, do you mind if I come in? And I'd love to work with the kids a little bit and kind of redirect and model for them without modeling for them, okay. if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we spend time doing that, modeling in the moment because it's needed. Because if we walked away, we knew that things would not go well academically for students if we didn't um, intervene. So those are those intervening moments. It's the teachable moments for teachers, if that makes sense. And that was what I would add for the for the secondary as well. It's what happened, um, not necessarily uh, scheduled or intended, but it was a behavior that was called for at that particular moment, um, and the teacher or coach was observed responding right on the spot. And we recognize the other categories seem to be like if it doesn't fit anywhere else and so we have also talked about uh, breaking that down so that we can really hone in on what's happening rather than calling it other. Gotcha. Thank you. At some point other does need to exist. We want to see 10,000 categories. But when it's the largest category. <laughs> Agreed. Point well taken. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, what else? So next you're going to uh, find a chart indicating the percentage of students showing reading proficiency on the NSGRA uh, by grade level by school um, you're going to see that this is really a time that a teacher one-on-one -on -one can take with a student listen to them read and really get to know what the needs of the students are this data the hard part of this data and the reason that we're we're looking at other alternatives is the data is as good as the trained person is in giving it. Um, so that's the, the good, the bad, and the ugly with um, NSGRA. But it does give us a point, right? A point of start, a point to see where we can start intervening. And if we could um, call back to the MTSS process, we're constantly looking at data. Is the intervention working for the student? Is it not? Do we need to reconvene as a team? Do we need to provide that? Um, we use this data as well in part with our decision-making process with the SIM model. So um, I just wanted to include that there, but that's the caveat with the NSGRA data. Can I talk to you? Okay, so there's some, and yes, we see frequently across the district. The numbers are alarming for me there, um, mm -hmm. especially for Highlands. Um, and we have schools that are doing well with it. Is there, where the schools that are doing so well with this, coaching some of the schools that have or need, I know it may be different demographics or whatever, they do, but it's, it's the same test, but what could we, what's working, what's not with some of the schools that are doing? Uh, we absolutely, that's a, a point well taken. The coaches meet on a monthly basis and they share their strategies and they look at data and they have that uh, big group chat and then small within. The principals and assistant principals meet on a monthly basis 
as professional learning teams. So they bring a problem of practice and they share with each other some best practices that have worked. So we do harness what other schools are doing. Um, you called out Highlands and that's one of our BSI schools, our Bureau of Support. And so those schools are getting a lot of um, hands on, not only within their school, not only from peers, but we as a district spend a lot of quality time of supporting in that manner, you will see um, the traction and movement because we have seen it at Central. Uh, we walk Central every week, but our staff is there almost on a daily basis supporting them. Say that again, it's Kindergarten at Highlands. Can I, can I call out a staff member? Um, kindergarten at Highlands was a very big challenge this year because all of these teachers were new and this is a school with students with a lot of challenges and come with a lot of unfinished learning. Um, we had Janine um, Wilson, right? Um, Janine went out as a district person. Do you remember I, I talked about um, that we have some of our non-classroom instructional folk helping. She went in, there was a vacancy, it was kind of rolling in and out. Not only did she get that classroom up and running and those kids successful, she really brought together that team and really modeled what is the PLC um, supposed to look like in planning and working with each other. And she still goes back and gives some resources. The kinder so, team. The kinder team, yes. She did. She did more than we asked. We asked her to teach a class, and she taught the teachers at grade levels to touch every kid. She didn't stop. <laughs> <laughs> right. <Four> weeks. <laughs> now, remember also, this data is a little dated. It didn't just happen. We used it in between. And so what you're getting today, board, is really an update for the last time. But remember, time has lapsed since last time. So we've... You know, we're bringing you up to speed on all of the data. There's one implementation question. I hate to get into the weeds, but since this is an issue that we're struggling with a little bit, how exactly does a coach work? So if you've got five periods a day, who's making it up? I'm just, just for me, the truth, right? Yeah. From this hour to this hour, I'm in English class. From this hour to this hour, this hour to this hour, I'm at lunch. When does a coach actually physically get to actually teach the student? Do they have to pull them from their gym class to, to get them to teach them? Because they teach them during the math class, that curriculum timeline is still moving forward. So if they're, how does a, they physically teach them? How does a coach actually do their work with the student that's behind? Did you, for the coaches to have the most impact, they're coaching the adults. So I'm taking Janine's working side by side with that kindergarten teacher at Highlands and saying, let me show you how we do the small group. There's a separate opportunity for the coaches to work with small groups of students mm -hmm. or parents to work with small groups of students or the kindergarten team to say, this group of students gets it. So we're gonna divide up these two groups of students into smaller groups and work one-on-one -on -one or in smaller groups with them. And that's that intervention period, their MTSS time. And so it's designated time during the end of the day outside of the 90 minute reading block, the 60 minute math block, the 20 minutes of recess, the 30 minutes of social studies and science, where we have a specific, they used to call it RTI, walk to intervention. Yeah, I, was like I don't know what I, we call it now. Like the triple I, <laughs> like the triple two, I triple time, time that I was talking about earlier. That's what yeah, I was trying to get that's what to. We're talking about. Because, like, the triple I time, can we try to increase that like, as a more uniform standard? Because that's my issue. Because we can teach teachers how to become better teachers, but that student is struggling. That student is still struggling. You know what I mean? Like, they need to learn the, you know, the fractions. They don't need to be a coach on how to be a better teacher. They need to coach. The student needs help. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like a lot of times these students are struggling. They don't have time to go. The parents can't let them go after school because they have no transportation issues. You know what I mean? And that's why I kept like, man, I know triple I time is maybe not paid for by the state. Maybe there's a, there's a big way to go around it. But at some point, the rubber needs to meet the road, and that kid needs extra. So before we go on to the science data, um, I'll address your thought in this way. The beauty about, and, and the curse, right? But the beauty of the elementary master schedule is that we have more flexibility within today to meet those demands of students. Unlike um, 
middle and high school, our intervention doesn't have to happen only during this 45 minute block. We can move the schedule around and make things happen for students as needed. Um, but what is key is really to focus on tier one, to really strengthen that base instruction that all kids get, to really understand that even though tier one is for all kids, we have to differentiate within that time so that they're able to access that support. We do that a lot through small group. In our 90 minute block, we differentiate with scaffolds and support with during the 30 that we have eyeball to eyeball instruction. And then during the small groups, we differentiate and provide that for them. That's in addition to tier two, tier three, some students receive um, the SIM process in addition to. So it really is not easy to pinpoint because we don't have a period of day that we do this. We are actively engaged in teaching from bell to bell and we have tier one, tier two, tier three, and SIM happening simultaneously throughout the day in different grade levels. So we're a little more difficult to put into a box that's linear. We're more, um, we're more of a bubble map of things happening in the school site. Um, but going on with the science data, if you look in page number six, um, the NWA science data informed the SIM process, and I am so uh, pleased to share with you this chart on page six, uh, which shows proficiency of all elementary schools and K-8s as evidence on the uh, science mock exam. So what is significant about this is the science mock exam has proven to have a strong correlation to uh, the proficiency on state assessment. So that means that if we're showing proficient in the mock, the likelihood of being proficient on the state exam is very, very high. I want to give a shout out uh, to Cindy Long, um, to the content team that serves science, and also to the schools to really giving time and attention to science and providing them this opportunity to really showcase what the kids can learn. Um, the focus of the modified SIM process is only on students who were not mastering the standards on PM2. So here's where we get interesting. Students showing proficiency, those are not the students that we're sharing data with you on. We're, we pull the kids that are um, what we call students on the bubble, on the rise, but not quite there yet. So that means that when we looked at what standards we were gonna work on with the SIM, they vary school by school, because it depends what standards the kids in those specific schools did meet proficiency. So it's very unique to the student. SIM is cyclical, but it's also very specific. So it lives, where does this data live? It lives in School City, and it lives in multiple spreadsheets. Um, today I'm sharing the chart on page seven, which indicates how many schools are showing mastery in at least seven or more ELA standards, 13 or more math standards, and 19 or more standards in science, which are the common standards in need of reteaching among the elementary schools. Um, all of the schools have made progress but support has been shifted to those that have not yet demonstrated the proficiency that we're seeking um, in these particular strands. So um, I do wanna thank Mrs. Burdett, Mrs. Obeda Garcia, Mrs. Rodriguez Perez, who continue to support schools through data reviews in collaboration with REA, and problems to practice in principal and assistant principal professional learning teams. And that's how we use the power of the knowledge across our district to help the schools that are in greatest need is through those uh, professional leadership teams. And with that, I, uh, unless you have other questions for me, I'd like to turn it over to Michelle Hedinger on behalf of Dr. Allen. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so as Dr. Reyes described the elementary process, um, she did indicate slightly that in secondary it does look a little bit different, okay? So as we move forward, I'm gonna share some of the best practices that um, are really on your bullet sheet, but also describe a little bit about the process that, that we've engaged in um, this spring. Uh, we talk about our, she talks about sim lessons or um, assessments. We talk about a lot of mock exams at secondary level. And so as a parent, you've probably heard 
some of that at home as well. But we've been administering them from February until April this year. Um, and while they are certainly used to gain valuable insight as to what teachers can do to inform and then adjust instruction, they are also in our case used to uh, as it's called mock because we're mock, you know, we're we're emulating what that state assessment experience will look like because that is also part of it for students too is understanding what that looks like and what it feels like, uh, so they can be successful. Um, this year, our eighth grade science and civics um, teachers, as well as uh, coaches, available engaged in a data dig um, professional learning session. And so what this looks like is a reflection on the past year's data as well as past year's action plans, um, best practices that other schools have, been, have experienced and shared with each other, but then they also develop a new action plan. So after development of that, it, you know, the development of the plan alone is not enough. It's the implementation, the monitoring, and then the continued support between schools um, as well as district staff and all of our team members here today. Um, we also, there are some charts in here as well. Um, it's difficult, as Dr. Reyes said, to determine, you know, what that means. We're, we're not always comparing apples to apples. We have data here that talks, that gives you an indication of what past year data was, but that was a different group of students. So now we have a new group of students who are being assessed in the same uh, mock assessment, um, and it may look a little different based on their needs moving forward. Uh, we do have, uh, as well as elementary and science, some promising results as you can see on page 8 where we see NWEA proficiency as, as measured in December and then in the spring the mock. And we do see an increase in 11 out of our 13 schools. What's important to remember is that our support is a, a continuing process. When we see new data, we adjust our resources to meet the needs of our schools and our students. So if we see a need, then we come back to the table during our debrief sessions or any really conversation throughout the week between Dr. Allen and myself, our coordinators, uh, our district resource teachers, and then figure out how to kind of zig and zag in order to best support. Um, in addition, as you know, Schools have been engaged in extended learning opportunities before school, during school, after school, and they've also adjusted in the month leading up with boot camps and whatnot. Some of you may have seen those experiences being advertised uh, as well. Hey, can I ask a question? Because I'm reading your chart on page eight, and I'm trying to understand this, um, because you have a little white chart on the bottom, right? And it shows the NWA compared to the eighth grade mock, right? Say, for instance, let's look at then John's at 13, right, for eighth grade mock. Mm -hmm. If you look at the chart above it, it says grade eight science mock, then John at 33. I'm confused, is there like two different mock tests, or? There is two different measures here. Okay, and I'll call in Cindy, too, to help me explain this, just to be sure. But the top chart that says eighth grade mock average percent correct is the average I mean, just what it says, the average percent correct, whereas below on the other data source, it is the predicted proficiency rate of students. What happens with the learned models? And so you can look at an average, but what does that mean? Is it 60 percent, 70 percent, 80 percent? Or is I didn't realize that when I saw grading average, I thought it was an average test. It's almost average of multiple years. I mean, we average score versus predicted proficiency. Okay, so 
the predictive proficiency is not something that they took. I thought they took the smock test, and that's what they scored on the mock test. Based on a score from the second PMI? No, 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 no. Science, Uh, and finally, middle school acceleration is also another um, component that we closely monitor and has been over um, the last several years one of our strengths. Uh, we have an established monitoring system that allows us to track the maximum acceleration rate that any middle school could earn um, if all students were to pass the assessments, but it also gives us indicators along the way when students are not being successful so that we can intervene. Um, and make some decisions that are student-centered as far as that is concerned. And finally, in support of our pre-K through 12 system, we recognize that, that, that uh, we're about to talk a little bit about high school graduation rate, that this is really the responsibility of the entire um, academic team. And so uh, we do have acceleration opportunities outside of that. Um, for all of our middle school students and we closely monitor those high school credits so that we are setting them up for success before they ever enter high school and that's monitored on a consistent basis. So I guess the last question for middle school before you do the battle handoff. Yeah. Um, how do we de describe the disparity between those? Like I said, I'm looking at Dendron and Parkway. They're so much lower than the rest. The rest are kind of like more or less in the same kind of range. I mean, it's always like an outlier. What do we do for those outliers? Well, in, the, in particular, those two schools receive a, a lot of love and support, okay? So not only do we have teachers who have gone into those classrooms to teach in some um, critical vacancies, but we also have a large number of the um, district resource teachers throughout the district that are pushing in and providing interventions to students as well. And a lot of that was based on I mean, this is part of the data that helps us make that decision. We really started that when earlier on in the year, um, but it's all hands on deck. So even, for example, Dr. Allen is assigned to um, Parkway Middle School for civics as a social studies teacher, so that is one of his assignments as well. I'm like being the coach, like what you said. So we'll Except make they're sure actually going and teaching these kids. Because okay. they're yeah. not only desperate, yeah. but they're like more. Yeah. Just, just mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there have been some really amazing things that have come out of this opportunity for staff to push into schools. And so probably some things that we may not have ex expected. So for example, in civics review, uh, we have um, a new Canvas course because one of our Canvas gurus was pushing into a full-time to a, a civics course teaching civics, found and saw a need, paired it with her area of expertise, and is now working with our uh, Mr. Lugo, our um, district resource teacher, to provide that. So there are little things that have actually come about that we probably wouldn't have anticipated or expected, but we're really pleased to see some of those partnerships have flourished. And so next Tuesday, we're going to pull together all of the district resource teachers as well as teaching and learning team that have been pushing into school settings in Buster, providing these interventions and the support so that we can talk about what we learned and what we'll do to improve our supports for schools moving forward as a result of this. So do we modify the school improvement plan too? Because obviously they haven't planned from being in the year. And if those outliers were behind, are we looking at where the deviations were? Are we looking to see that they follow their own plan? Maybe they didn't follow the plan. Because just because they wrote in the beginning of the year doesn't mean that they were actually executing. Are we looking for those deviations as well? Well, that happens monthly. I just have to make that the school site. Every month, every school K-12, or VP K-12, we use the stock take process so that they can keep a handle on all of their set goals and what are next steps. If we're not achieving what we should be seeing at this point, 
what should we do, who's responsible, give a timeline, and they go back. Make them officially amend the SIP. Oh, the SIP is, is a, evolving. You know, because we always prove it, the school board really proves it mandates it at the end of the year. But if we see they're not going there, do we officially, it never comes back to the board technically, but. That's a part of your stop take action plan, though. So. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Ready? Yes. Ready, ready. Okay. So just as our middle school partners um, have described, our high school students were also afforded opportunities to um, emulate the assessment um, environment by engaging in mock exams as well. Um, we did that for algebra, geometry, biology, and U.S. history, and this data is provided for you over on page 9. In addition to strengthening conceptual understanding and assessment preparedness of our students, the mock exam data was instrumental in guiding and adjusting instruction, identifying specific areas of strengths, such as in biology and U.S. history, and core academic areas for growth opportunities in areas such as, of course, algebra and geometry. In our previous uh, board workshop, um, specifically designed to address academic success. I referenced the benefits of students who spend six or more hours utilizing official SAT practice or OSP Khan Academy, um, having the potential to increase their scores on SAT by 39 points. So since our last workshop, um, we have continued to capitalize and leverage the impact of Khan Academy. Um, right now with 94% of our high school students activated with the Khan Academy account. Um, we are definitely on the right trajectory to supporting our high school seniors who are still in need of obtaining that concordant score. Um, of the approximate 859 seniors in this particular category of meeting that concordant score, 97% of those students are actively engaged in our OSP Khan Academy platform. And that's helping to strengthen their ability at obtaining that concordant score needed for graduation. We're also being proactive by um, engaging our 9th through 11th grade students in Khan Academy so that we can proactively achieve concordant and graduation requirements for them prior to entering 12th grade. Another update in, is our overall 5% acceleration increase, which is reflected in the chart on page 10. The increase can be attributed to growth in industry certifications and completions. Currently, we are on track to meet or exceed our certifications and completions with an increase of 1,490 completions just since January. We can also ascertain that the increase in our acceleration rate was due in part uh, to our AP exam passing rate which has increased by 718 exams. That is definitely something that we are celebrating. From last year or from? This what? was during last year, yes ma'am. So that gave us a total of 3,677 passing exams for our senior. So from 2021, 20, there was an increase of 718. 18. Passing awesome. exams. Not wow. Exams, yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. Wow. So definitely that aided in attributing to where we were able to gain that 5% overall increase. Um, while we are still striving for continuous improvement, I'm all about continuous improvement uh, and growth, uh, we are definitely moving in the right direction there. So one of our key next steps in our acceleration continuous um, improvement efforts is to ensure that we measure and implement assistance with our dual enrollment access for all identified eligible students. Uh, for this reason, we are continuing our efforts to strengthen our dual enrollment pipeline through our partnership with Valencia. And currently, Valencia is implementing a system-wide DE expansion, and we're placing intentional efforts to increase enrollment of students at our Title I high schools uh, with primary emphasis on Point Siena High School and Liberty High School. Now, on dual enrollment, are they trying to coordinate, like, student schedules? Like, say, for instance, like, we, you know, whatever. If they're dual enrolled, um, in other words, take all of our 9 to 12, be all of our high school on campus things, because they got to move away. Right? Dual enrollment, they have to go to Valencia to actually take the class, right? Yes, sir. So are we trying to coordinate with them to say, I'm just giving you an example, then Valencia classes be taught from, like, 1 to 3? That, are, that can be our cohort, so that way, instead of having us to do a dance with the scheduling at our high school level or trying to coordinate with Valencia that way. 
they have been very flexible with us in providing options. We also want to give student autonomy in their preference. Um, so some of the students, based on their particular um, pathway, may have classes that are offered earlier in the day versus um, the, the, the later latter part of the day. Um, so we do have provisions with Valencia to give students that flexibility. Um, so to answer your question, sir, their schedule at Valencia is built first. And then our school counselors at our high schools go back and they build their uh, on-campus uh, schedule around that based on the, the needs of the student and also the choice of the student. You mentioned that you had specific strategies for getting students from Liberty and Poinciana to have higher rates of dual enrollment. Did I get that correct? Yes, we did. Okay. What do you know what the barriers are for those students? Is it the PERT? Is it transportation? Is we're, it? We're working, I can tell you we are um, identifying a combination of both. Um, first and foremost, it's the transportation uh, piece. We are actively engaging in, in some conversation right now on being able to solidify and work the transportation component out. Um, and in regards to the testing aspect, we are actually um, engaging. We actually currently, and I'll talk about that in a little bit, we have an open window right now um, um, for PERT, but we also have that as an opportunity for students because that's still a measure for them for access for dual enrollment. So yes ma'am, through boot camp preparations, um, exposure on campus as well as at Valencia, uh, making sure our students are prepared. We even have Valencia staff. Um, definitely want to give recognition to Dr. Bosley and his team um, where they are actually going into our high schools and um, helping to prepare students, uh, pr to prepare them to take the PERT as well. My pleasure. Okay, so um, a key area in which we are continuing um, to improve is by affording students opportunities as well to, we want to continue with increasing that pass rate for AP exams. So we had our students, um, they're actually in that process of, um, they actually completed mock AP exams. Just like our mock exams for state tested areas, our AP mock exams provide students with an opportunity to prepare and strengthen their stamina. That's very critical um, on being able to um, strengthen that stamina to compete the, complete the rigorous AP exams. Our AP mock exams also inform teachers of how best to plan and adjust instruction and preparation for students to take those exams as well. As, I was gonna say, yes, I, thank you. particular data is reflected on pages 11 and 12. Um, our mock exam data reveals that our high school students are currently on track to meet or exceed the AP exam pass rate in key areas such as biology, calculus AB, chemistry, English language and composition, as well as Spanish literature. Our mock exam data also informed instructional staff areas on focus areas to pay close attention to before we start those mock exam, those actual exams rather, um, the first week of May, um, with looking at areas such as environmental science, statistics, and government and politics. This year, which was very critical for us as we engaged in the mock exams, it was critically important for our students to have this mock experience because College Board is in the process of. Uh, transitioning their AP exams to a digital platform. Are those the total number of students that took the class just so you took the, the exam mock exam? There was a significant reduction in, last, in this year's participation in the mock exams compared to last year. Yes. So some of that is, uh, go to that. So we just talked about earlier with students that actually took the real exam, mm -hmm. not the mock exam. So we have more students that really took the exam scoring three or four. These yes. are mock exams, not yes, the sir. exams. Not the actual exams. Yes, sir. Because they don't need to take it if they feel confident, right? We still provide that opportunity. We still want to provide that because we want to, of course, strengthen their stamina, actually have them. We have some students engaging in two or three exams. 
um, on a particular day. So it's important that they really build that stamina of being able to start testing this level of rigorous um, examination from 8 a.m. in the morning upwards until 4 or 5 in the evening. Right. So why did it go down by almost half? Some of that had to do with the level of enrollment, um, but I can get you more specifics of that and follow up. Oh, the that. number of students that are in AP classes. Yes, sir. Keep, yes, sir. Keep in mind, this is um, one year is not comparison to the next year because there may be a different number of students enrolled in a particular course from one year to the next. Mm -hmm. so, um, as I was stating, um, the digital, uh, the exams rather are shifting to that digital platform. So the mock exam experience this year afforded students an opportunity to kind of simulate what it's going to be like to actually take an AP exam on a digital platform. Moving on, if you think back to our previous academic success uh, board workshop, we discussed the implementation of Zello as our vehicle to facilitate a holistic approach towards the portrait of the graduate. In its third year of implementation, our elementary and secondary schools have exceeded our goal of having 75% Zello lesson completions affording students the ability to explore post-secondary pathways and access research careers, uh, colleges, financial planning, and setting goals for post-secondary success. When reviewing our post-secondary progress data from April uh, 2022 in comparison to this current April, um, you'll see from the provided data on page 13 that we are on track to exceed both our confirmed <coughs> post-secondary plans and our confirmed FOSFA submissions. That's important for our students who are actively looking to um, move on to college to be able to have the financial resources and support um, to achieve that goal. To bring this full circle, um, as we prepare for one of the greatest milestones in our students' lives, which is graduation, I will have the pleasure of spending some quality time with all board members then. Um, <laughs> I would like to end with providing you with an update on our high school continuous improvement prog progress. So since January, our high schools have worked feverishly to ensure that all of our identified at-risk students met the concordance score for reading and math. Um, and they have met all of the requirements to be eligible for graduation. Our leadership team members at each of our high schools have been able to work with students not only on a one-on-one -on -one basis, but in small group settings as well. I've had the pleasure of working with a reading group at Zenith High School. It's been very, very rewarding for me. Um, I, I, find, I find pleasure in being able to support those students and going back to my, my first route in education as a reading teacher. And how many and, um, students have your concordance score, Dr. Evans? I have all of my students with the exception of three <laughs> who have met their concordance score. And um, we celebrate um, that the fact that they will be graduating. I look forward to shaking their hand come May. <laughs> uh, but say not to say all of our leadership teams are doing that. Um, our high schools are also providing extended learning opportunities that are not only embedded within the school day, uh, but also on weekends, after schools. We're doing what it takes to make sure that we provide opportunities for our students to work towards obtaining concordance. In addition to that, um, I, I want to give recognition to Ms. Brown, our high school director, who has been very, very beneficial and a great addition to our team. Um, she works with our high schools on a bi-weekly uh, basis to make sure that we are actively reviewing uh, the graduation progress monitoring data. Um, and that data is actually provided for you on pages 14 and 15. <coughs> Overall, this is definitely something to um, take a moment to just be thankful and celebrate. Um, we have been able to impact an additional 1,115 seniors who have met graduation requirements since January. So I definitely want to uh, give thanks to the team for those hard works and efforts of doing that. Our students have been able to um, achieve this through getting concordance through ACT and SAT. I do want to take a moment to um, just quickly mention um, information that's recently been brought to our attention as it relates to amendment an amendment to House Bill 1537. Um, this was just recently filed and it will set concordance scores for both the class of 2023 and 2024. Um, the provision of this bill would take effect immediately upon approval. Um, and what this bill would do, it would actually roll back the concordance score requirements um, to last year's standards for ELA FSA um, and partially roll back the requirements for algebra EOC. 
Essentially, the difference would be uh, students would be able to earn concordance by taking the PERT, but the requirement would be for at a 114, as opposed to in the past it was at a 97. We've been proactive in our high schools with already scheduling a window for students to take PERP. Any student who needs a math concordant this particular week, um, before this news even came out, we had already heard inclinations of a possibility. So we were proactive in scheduling this window to provide this opportunity for our students. Um, I can tell you as of yesterday, we, and, and prior to doing that, we also incorporated uh, boot camp opportunities so students were not taking this test cold. And so does that mean we just learned that um, our seniors and juniors, yes. because we're going to go ahead and roll in the class of 2024, mm -hmm. because they will have to meet the higher concluded scores next year. Mm -hmm. That is already a part of this amendment. Um, they can take the FSA, well not FSA, they can take the PA3, mm -hmm. get same day results yes. um, this spring, which is a new opportunity for them to also potentially meet graduation requirements. So we're implementing that as well. And again, that's helpful because not only will it capture our seniors, but we can also work with our juniors to be to kind of get that advanced start for them as well. Um, this ultimately, if I could just bring this down to numbers, could impact 859 additional seniors being eligible for graduation. Okay. One other thing I would just add quickly, um, I just got this information this morning. Uh, Dr. Mr. Terry and Dr. Torres' office um, has been working with our CP data. I know we've been looking for and some anxious for Osceola Prosper students. Uh, we've had 1,466 class of 2022 graduates who did enroll at Valencia over the course of the last year, either fall or spring, um, to take advantage of the Osceola Prosper program. Interestingly enough, the majority of them, 76%, are enrolled in classes on the West Campus face-to-face. -face. Vast majority wanted to do face-to-face -face rather than online learning, which we um, appreciate. We don't yet have performance in the classes that they enrolled in, but they've enrolled in 2,991 course enrollments during from this cohort, and only two of those, or less than 1%, were developmental or remedial courses. The rest of them are pursuing freshman composition, student experience, college algebra, U.S. government. So I'll be excited to see the rest of this data. That'll be something that the team can share with you over the course of the summer and next fall. But exciting to see that many kids who did take advantage of Osceola Prosper when we only have a small window of opportunity to tell them about. Okay. That was the exact question I was going to ask <laughs> next, because we have Prosper data now. I'm also curious if they can add to that. When they have to get to Valencia, I think they have to take a tape test or something see what proficiency level is before they're allowed to take the class. The tape is for ALCO. I think you have to have something similar to Valencia. Before you enroll in Valencia, you have to take the tape. So you automatically just enroll in a class? Yeah, yeah. You don't, they don't make you take a they don't make you take a free test at all? It's just the perk. The perk. Okay. Oh, so, so, so PERT is a substitute of the SAT if they didn't take it for whatever yeah. reason.
and um, board, although I do want to just reiterate, although this information is very hopeful for us as it relates to the amendments to the House bill, because it's not official and it's still tentative, we are still proceeding with making sure that we're preparing our students for our current graduation requirements. As Dr. Evans shared, high school has already been engaged in state assessments, and next week, keep our elementary and middle school students and teachers and administrators in mind because it's time to show what we know. That's our Thank you for your attention and let us know of any questions or feedback. Thank you. Thank you. Good stuff. Last one. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. Yeah, 35 minutes. Like <laughs>